This is it. These are the final build tasks before we fly. I see what you did. I don't know if you had to modify your bracket in order to accomplish this. That bracket is completely custom. All of what we're doing here with the, getting the controls down there is totally custom. After just over two years of living at this workstation, we've pulled all the airplanes out of the hangar to make room to get the RV-14 out from the back. And today is first engine start. We don't have keys. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about it earlier and I was like, I'm not gonna put them in. John, do you know where the key is? That's an Easter egg right there. The entire museum fleet is coming out of the hangar today for the first time in a long time. And after months of being careful not to turn the preserved engine crankshaft, we've removed the bottom spark plugs. Last drop, bags off, Neo and I'm carefully turning the prop through by hand to get the last of the preservation oil out. So we've had the oil in a bucket of hot water. Warm it up. So you want to talk through what kind of oil this is and why? This is AeroShell 100 Mineral, non-ashless dispersant. It actually kind of maximizes wear for the first break-in period. We want all those components to seat properly and so this will be the first start of our Lycoming IO390 Thunderbolt. So this is the final build vlog. I've been proud to share the full spectrum of emotions and experiences via two dozen episodes over the past couple years while we worked with industry leading partners and brought this airplane to life. As our test pilot buddy Elliot Sigwin describes it, we're building a shake and bake Vans Aircraft RV14 here. But that still leaves room for some customization opportunities such as this center console throttle. Now this airplane also has a constant speed prop, so not only did we need cables for the throttle and mixture, but the prop control cable, all three needed to be custom made. These guys were pretty cool. I had some good looking control cables right there. So I'm excited to work with you guys and it was very educational to go through this process because the idea that legally we could have used lawnmower or like snowmobile cables being new to this, I didn't understand all the fundamental differences. What's cool about these ones is they're Teflon inside and outside. Oh yeah. So these are the same ones that Cessna uses. These ain't no lawnmower cables. So here at McFarland, we're a leading manufacturer of engine and cabin environment controls as well as flight control cables and seat rails but specifically to you on these quadrant style controls. As far as OEMs, our controls are on all new Cessnas that come off the factory line. Our processes, our materials, our inspections, the quality control, all of it is industry leading. People would think that a conduit is a conduit. There isn't too much to that. Well, it's actually very complicated. We use a double spiral, two wire spiral for our conduit. Uh, this being because the radiuses in which you are bending these controls as they go through the firewall and weave their way around the engine mounts all play an effect in the friction that is applied to the inner wire that is sliding back and forth during use of this control. Also to how much play or travel is taken out of a control. Okay, I got it, yeah. Okay, stand by, hold it. During the initial installation, we were optimistic that we had the cable specs correct. Hold it, don't push. At McFarland, we worked with the uh, controls manager, Joe Cool, who was absolutely fantastic. Joe supplied all the cables with rod end bearings on both ends, and that'll work fine for the uh, engine. However, at the other end, there was insufficient room to use uh, rod end bearings between the various levers. So we are putting little clevises with clevis pins on this end, so I've got clearance between the, the various levers. Nice work, guys. That's the uh, quadrant, and Jeff Coombs, he put that together for us. This is one of the first quadrants to be put in an RV-14, very professionally done. I gave uh, Joe Cool at McFarland some very rudimentary drawings, and uh, he converted that to very professional engineering drawings which I had to sign off on and was pleased to do so. So that all went really well. But it
it wasn't until this first engine start that we knew for sure if we had the control cables correct. Pulling the airplane outside for the first time was super exciting. But troubleshooting the issues got boring for the little guys really fast. Yeah, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things, yeah. So that's a cable issue. That's what it is. Because it doesn't seem like there's any more throw to have. But these things are designed to have a certain throw. Like this is a big, that's why it's such a challenge to get these right. Dave, can you go to full rich? Papa? Mine How almost goes underneath. Five yeah. minutes. Five minutes, five minutes. It's in the stop, it's, it's in the bottom of the, the quadrant. It's bottomed out. Troubleshooting took a little bit more than five minutes, but we'll get back to the engine start shortly. Say you came to us and you needed three and a half inches of travel. We actually have to calculate more than three and a half inches of travel and make an educated assessment of what type of bends is that control going to go through to get from point A to point B because that is actually going to absorb some of the travel. Having the first set of cables installed allowed us to tweak the specs for the second and ultimately final set. We were close, but not quite with the first try of the cables, right? Our second try, what we did is we made measurements where we needed the center line of the barrel in the fully extended position and in the fully closed position. And John developed this matrix here. All we did was we sent this exact page right here to McFarland, and it looks like it hit the nail right on the head. So we're just verifying that right now. Comparing actual dimensions here with the matrix there. Looking good so far. Bang on, okay, so that's good. This is extremely common, especially on a new build where there isn't a control to duplicate. We're going completely from new. Um, and you guys are making custom modifications along the way, it's not uncommon that we end up building controls two and three times. In preparation for inspection, we had to do a fuel flow test. You ready? Tell me when. Okay, anytime. That's quite manageable, that flow rate. Yeah. I was afraid it's gonna come out there like gangbusters. Get it steady, yeah. there's no bubble. No, not a bubble. And that's indicating 45 gallons 45 an hour. 45 gallons an hour. And then we're just going to cross check the mass and see if that is yeah. true. Yeah. How close are you? We'll give you a countdown. They're getting there. All right. We're about an inch away. Three, two, one. Now. Perfect. Nice. One minute, 20 seconds. Cool. That's 50, 50 gallons an hour. We need 50% more than 16 gallons an hour. Oh, Pretty 16. good. So we needed like, what's that, another 50%, so eight. eight. We needed like 22 eight. gallons an hour to so double that. Well over double. <laughs> then we sealed everything back up and pressurized the system to look for leaks. Then it was the last of the rivets. Closing holes on the floor for the trike gear and installing the data plate. Ironically, I'm more comfortable doing flush rivet work at this point than pull rivets, which are few and far between on this kit. Next, it was the pedostatic system test and certification. It was fun to watch the panel indicating a climb to 8,000 feet while sitting in the hangar. Then, to weight and balance. Once again, the Burford brothers were doing the heavy lifting. Okay, uh, where are you at? Well, left front is 592. Right front is 591. And the tail is 68. The stock sticks are pretty long, so I had Vans send me detailed images of the factory RV14 that I'd previously flown. It has the same grips as we do, and I wanted to match the length because I really liked it. And the last steps before final inspection included installing the vinyl tail number and calibrating the fuel senders. Okay, master on. Oh, gotta go into config mode though. We're aiming to be accurate down to the gallon. Now this is gonna be some precision pumping. We're working with a Canadian fuel truck that pumps in liters. 75.6. Okay, and that catches us back up to the somewhat anticlimactic first start. This is a non-event. Both ignition breakers are pulled. There's yeah. no ignition. Okay. Mixture's cut off. The mags are off. I'm just 
gonna crank until we see oil pressure on the instrumentation. And the bottom plugs are out. Yes. Keep in mind, we're spinning at we'll hundreds, go. low hundreds of RPMs, right? Like two, 300 RPM. Our oil filter is almost certainly empty. We're pumping oil through the system and this is just to get the head pressure there so that when it does start, it's pretty much pressure. Yeah. Clear prop. Clear prop. Okay, it's 10 seconds. Oh, it's coming up now. Yeah, now we got it. It's in the yellow, it's 40 PSI, so we're, we're good. All right. All right, so bottom plugs are going back in. Fuel pressure, what's the wrench? Torque those up. And then it's really just validating that the EGT, CHT, oil T, all that stuff is coming up over the two minute period. Yeah. Which I'll just be kind of watching. So we had a pretty ambitious checklist that we wanted to get through on this first start, but spoiler alert, we did not even get through half of it. Hey, okay, we're gonna try it, give us a second. Here we go. Clear prop! Clear, clear prop. Now rock it. Oh, come on. Oh, I said bigger battery. We're losing the power now. I re-rebooted the system. <sighs> From the low volts. Yeah. Mags switch off. Mags off. Master off. So watching this is kind of cringy because if we had just used our backup avionics battery, we would have protected the system from rebooting when the main battery failed. So we hooked up a ground power unit to try again. And by this point, we'd lost most of the audience because, well, it wasn't super exciting. Clear. You're good. Let it, you're good. Let it run. Let the avionics reboot. Okay. I'm about to start the uh, charger. So we're gonna get exactly a thousand close enough. Let's go mag left. Left. Down in. Okay, on, 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 on. Okay, we got a dead mag. What we thought was a bad mag turned out to be a 12 volt wiring issue. So we wired it directly to the battery to resolve that. But the battery itself was replaced before trying again as it was too small for our Lycoming EIS application. So it was a noble effort, the Odyssey, but didn't work out. Just not quite enough for our setup. This is a little bit lighter than what we had, but also provides four times the cold cranking amps. Four times. Well, it's 600 CCA and the other one's 170. So the only downside is a little less firewall forward weight. And, you know, there's a lot of stigma about lithium, but this is lithium iron phosphate. These cells can actually be exposed directly to oxygen and still be stable. Whereas like a lithium ion or a lithium polymer would... Uh, Blow up? Yeah, they'll ignite. And it's a chemical fire. Bad day. Yeah, it's not what you want. This second start was a lot more successful, but keep in mind part of our objective here is to minimize the amount of ground run time at low power before this engine is broken in. Clear prop! Here we go. Oil pressure. Here, check it to check, you got me? Yeah, I got you. Going back to 1,000 RPM. It's going to be running a little rough for a second here. Okay, just maintaining 1,000. Oil pressure, 68. 68. We were able to completely run through the first start checklist. No. Plus voltage, 13.1, now bring the alternator on. Could be a huge amount of inrush current. Yeah, Holy yeah, the battery will take 60 amps no, all day long. 65, 66. Yep. Okay. Okay, she's so running smooth. Let's see, uh, we, we're going to wait for temp now. We've got 100 back. Fahrenheit. I think that's pretty good. So let's do a mag check at 1,000. There, that's fine. So 1050, we'll do a left mag check. We'll get ready for it to fail. No, nope. both. Laying a finish dropping. Okay, yep. back, back to, it went to 960. Back to both. And it's back to 1,030. Ooh, yeah, right mag. Now, excellent. Okay, both. Both. Let's bring her up to, uh, to 2,000. 2,000 RPM, here we go. Oh, this is silk. Okay, let's start cycling the prop. Oh, it's cycling now, eh? Get it a few times. Yeah, because it's got to get the air out of the system, right? Yeah. Perkin. Okay, what, three times? Yeah, three times. On the first start attempt, we failed to get the prop to cycle at 1500 RPM. And even this time at 2000 RPM, it took a fair bit of movement on the prop control to get those initial cycles but as the system filled with oil, it worked. And we got through the rest of the list with no significant issues, setting us up for final inspection. Good. 
So we built an airplane that seems to be ready to fly. We just need to get through the final inspection and test flying, which is what comes next. We were lucky. Ironically, our advantage of working in a museum setting with this team of volunteers that are all retired guys, which was a big advantage in the beginning, became a disadvantage because of the nature of what ended up happening with lockdowns and shutdowns. But we're still in shape. I think we're going to make it to Osh. That's our goal. I'll be there. It's just a question of whether the plane will make it or not, but I think we're going to make it. It just won't be painted. Yeah, you don't need paint. <laughs> Yeah, she'll fly without paint, that's right. So that's where we're at. But I'm super excited that the interior will be complete. Yeah, you wouldn't want to take a nice quadrant setup like you have and attach it to some bicycle cable controls because all the design and quality that went into that quadrant would be lost in the feel of a, a lower quality control. Right, the feel is a big one, right? Yes. And, and it can change over time. If you use a crappier one, it might seem good in the beginning. And I guess talking about guys who are like, yeah, you just lubricate it, just pull the cable out and lubricate it. It was interesting on that first call that we did, we were like, do not. Do not do that. Um, <laughs> in the B-roll that we sent you, you'll see Joe apply a thick lubrication compound right before he kind of swages the control closed. And that lubricant is there for the life of that control. If the control is feeling like it needs lubrication, it's telling you that it has reached the end of its life there is a good chance, whether it's our control or anyone else's control, a good chance that the inner wire that is moving back and forth within that conduit has either cut through the inner sleeve and is now contacting that metal conduit. So now you have metal on metal cutting one another, uh, eventually will cut through that inner wire and you will lose your control. The other downside to putting oil into that control is it travels back out on the push rod as you put that control through its motion. And especially on the engine compartment side, as that push rod comes out, that oil residue that's on there will collect any of the dust and debris. And then you pull that control back and it pulls all that dust and debris right back into that conduit, which in turn is gonna create friction and binding over time. It's gonna work as an abrasive. In the production process, each control is inspected multiple times by different people. We do not allow the person who fabricated the control to do the final inspections. It has to be another certified inspector within our organization just to ensure that all possible errors are caught. So that's a 10x magnifier. What he's looking for in those swages is any cracks in the material, any abnormalities in the swage itself. We find anything, the control scrapped, we start over again. So what is a swage? You've got that metal sleeve crimped around the conduit and that's holding that end piece onto the conduit so the push rod can travel. You are getting all the components and all the quality and even the engineering support in the design of your custom that we utilize on our approved controls. Your custom control isn't coming to you FAA PMA because one, it's an experimental aircraft, but we even do custom controls for certified aircraft, but we aren't going through the added expense of submitting to the FAA. You know, it's an owner provided part at that time. So it's bittersweet to end this series, but the next phase is really exciting to me, mission planning and executing in this airplane. For more building content, I highly recommend the following creators. Their links are in the description. Hey everyone, I'm Christine from Plane Lady. Come follow along as we build our RV10 in our garage and share helpful tips and tricks we learned from our experience and from other builders along the way. This is Gil from Build Fly Go. Our channel covers our super speedy RV10 builds and our adventures in our RV9A. Our RV9A has been to all sorts of fun places and you can follow along in our videos on YouTube. Hey everybody, my name is Jason Ellis. I am a student pilot solo building a Vans RV10 over the course of the last couple of years. Come on down to my channel and check it out. Remember, if I can do it, you can do it. I mean, if you had to escape the zombies, it would work. Right. Zombie apocalypse ready, but not Transport Canada approved. <laughs> There's your title. Boom. This airplane would flee the zombies. No problem. So today we are emptying out the hangar and we're going to pull out. Perry has COVID. And I have crazy mad scientist COVID hair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>